How are you, Bishop? I'm well. And yourself, Ron? I'm fine. And I pray all yes. our viewers and listeners are as well in this Lenten time. And we, uh, and with Miss Ayers, we'll be in the midst of Holy Week. Yes, how about that? Yeah. And as always, we have a lot of questions to go to before we get to our gospel. Uh, Thank you. I'll just do a, a couple of um, calendar items, Ron, sure. and then I'll mention two other things. Sure. Okay. Thank you. So for, uh, obviously for calendar items, here we are in the midst of the holiest week of the church's year, liturgical year. So this will air, of course, on Holy Thursday when we celebrate the Lord's Supper. The following day, of course, we'll celebrate the Liturgy of the Lord's Passion, Saturday evening, the Easter Vigil, when we receive people into the Catholic Church through baptism and profession of faith, and then, of course, the glory of Easter Sunday, when we celebrate the Lord's Resurrection. So, uh, obviously, the one thing that I have on the calendar, I have all those things on the calendar, right? <laughs> but, of course, Easter Sunday, so you're welcome to join us for all, any and all of those liturgies. And, and especially, of course, we'll be celebrating Easter, as you will in your parish, and we'll be at the cathedral at 10. And then uh, Easter Monday and that week, I'll be celebrating the blessings of the Easter week. And there's lots of things going on, but I think we would just leave it there, and including a, a Thursday confirmation where I'll be thrilled to be at Transfiguration of the Lord Parish. And that's Thursday the 13th, I believe at 7 p.m. So we'll continue in, and you would know, Ron, that in the Easter octave, it, the joy is so great that it spills over into eight mm, days. Yes. It just can't be yes. one day. So that'll be a great joy. And then just two quick notes, Ron. Sure, sure. I would invite people to go to our website or to the uh, Ohio, uh, the Catholic Conference of Ohio, because back at the end of February, all the bishops signed a letter to the faithful, to all our brothers and sisters in Christ. And it's regarding, you know, our commitment to protect the sanctity of human life in light of groups that are, and I know they have now, proposed wording for an amendment to the Ohio Constitution to put it on the ballot in November, which is desirous to enshrine and expand abortion at the expense of protections for the preborn children and women. And so our Catholic Conference and all of our Catholics throughout all of Ohio will be collaborating with statewide organizations and diocesan respect life offices and seeking volunteers and folks from all our parishes to coordinate a campaign so that we might make information available and help to mobilize everyone so as to oppose that ballot initiative when it goes on the ballot for a vote in November. And then the second thing I'd like to mention is I recently had, and I, I should have mentioned it in earlier shows, but Ron, I had the great joy of being present for the inaugural launch event of our young Catholic professionals group. Mm, yes. And I am so enthusiastic about that, folks. So for those of you who are in your 20s or 30s, and that's not me, but for those of you in your 20, 20s or 30s, uh, they can go right to the website. It's Catholic Young Professionals Toledo, but it's not just Toledo. It's our whole diocese of Toledo. And I am so edified and encouraged by the young people who are involved in it right now and the young people who want to witness to their faith in the workplace and announce the gospel to other young people. It was an amazing event at the Pinnacle with, I think, uh, certainly over 300, almost 400 people. Really? It was standing room only. It was extraordinary. Wow. So kudos to them, and I look so forward to what they're going to be doing in the Diocese of Toledo. What a wonderful thing to bring young professionals. It was powerful. And, you know, one person said to me at the door, Bishop, people say the church doesn't do anything for young adults, and here this is. So thanks be to God, it's a way to really engage 20 and 30-somethings in the, our Catholic faith and our Catholic Church. Oh, how wonderful. It was phenomenal. Okay, we are going to move to our uh, gospel, and maybe you could give a little uh, Sure, Ron. Just, the, just the tee up, as golfers would say. So obviously, folks, the gospel proclaimed on Sunday is the passion, which we all engage in on Palm Sunday. So we've chosen to do the gospel. It's often called the first gospel traditionally. It's the gospel that's proclaimed when the procession is done from outside the church or just inside the narthex. And this is the gospel which begins the procession into the church with, you know, the blessing of palms. Good. Uh, thank, thank you. you. And it's from Matthew. When Jesus and the disciples drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find an ass tethered and a colt with her. 
untie them and bring them here to me. And if anyone should say anything to you, reply, the master has need of them. Then he will send them at once. This happened so that what had been spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled. Say to daughter Zion, behold, your king comes to you, meek and riding on an ass, and on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had ordered them. They brought the ass and the colt and laid their cloaks over them, and he sat upon them. The very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and strode them on the road. The crowds preceded him, and those following kept crying out and saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was shaken and asked, Who is this? And the crowds replied, This is Jesus the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Your thoughts? So folks, obviously Palm Sunday is something with which we're so familiar. The beginning of Holy Week, when we go to church, we receive the blessed palm, which then often we retain in our homes as a, as a sign, as a sacramental of all of Holy Week 2023. I think it's important for us to hear again this language. And this is, this is the account of Jesus' triumphal entrance into Jerusalem. And we hear at one point, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. That should sound familiar because we sing or say those words in every Mass right before the Eucharistic prayer begins. So it's it's a triumphal announcement, Hosanna in the highest before the Eucharist, before Jesus is confected and he comes under the form of bread and wine in his true body and blood. So that's number one. Number two, it's important to recognize Jesus tells us about this. Clearly, he's about to go into his passion. And what happens, he says, go get this ass and this colt. And it even he even tells us that this happened so that the prophet might be fulfilled. Behold, your king comes to you, meek and riding on an ass, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. So while they they are greeting him as a king and lauding him and throwing their cloaks down and waving branches triumphantly, because remember, so many of the Jews still thought, well, if he's the Messiah, he's going to become a king in an earthly sense. But from the very entrance into Jerusalem, Jesus is giving them the sign he's coming in pure humility, not riding on some great you know, horse triumphantly as we see all these statues of great, you know, leaders and, and you know, captains in, from history, but instead he's coming on the foal of an ass, a colt. And that tells us what kind of a humble king he's going to be because he's going to go to the cross to suffer and die for our sins. So he's not the king they expected, but he is the king of our souls. And he is the king who we will proclaim in Holy Week and on this Holy Thursday, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest, as the Eucharist is consecrated, and he comes to us in the humility under the form of bread and wine. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you. Let's get a question in here quick. Uh, we'll go to Dolores from St. Aloysius. Uh, Thank you, Dolores. Dear Bishop, I love going to Stations of the Cross at different churches during Fridays in Lent. Beautiful. But when I go, some churches uh, do 14 stations, and some do the resurrection as the 15th station. Is there a matter of preference at these churches? When did the churches begin adding the 15th station? Thanks, Dolores. Thanks, Dolores. I don't know that we've ever had that question before, Ron, and I think it's a great Lenten question, so thank you for bringing it up from St. Aloysius, and I know there are people who are wondering the same question, so they're wondering what the answer is as well. Uh, Dolores, in a nutshell, the simple answer is that the practice of this 15th station, it's really kind of become more common, I would say, in the last 50 years or so, and so it's especially so through a number of groups that have, you know, sprung up like Corsio groups. And I know they do a 15 station all the time. And it's to obviously end the stations on an upbeat and positive note. So there are some retreat houses that I go to now that they have 
14 stations and they've added a 15th station for the resurrection. So it's a good question. Does it make it wrong? No. Is the traditional set of stations 14? Yes. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, remember, this is not the sacred liturgy itself. It's all paraliturgy. This is all a devotion. And it's a devotion to encourage people to engage the passion. And then sometimes they add a 15th to engage the outcome of the passion. So you can do a, a whole history of the Stations of the Cross. And we even joked last week, and I'll go to ask him again about the phrase that St. Francis added to the Stations of the Cross. But all through the centuries, the Stations of the Cross have been very much a part of our history. And you should probably know that it was in 1742 that Pope Benedict XIV exhorted all priests to enrich their churches with the way of the cross. So that's really when all churches were encouraged to have the stations of cross in the church and that they would be 14 crosses and then there might be some picture or image of the stations. So that began way back in the 18th century as a formal request of the Pope. But please understand that there is no rule saying there cannot be or must be a 15th station. Most churches, there are 14 stations, and that's to recall the passion of the Lord, some at a 15th, to indicate the outcome of that passion, which was the resurrection. All right. Thank you. Bishop, folks, we have to take just a quick break. Don't go anywhere. We're going to be right back. we got a lot of questions to get to. Stay right where you're at. Thank you, everyone. Annunciation Radio is your voice for the Diocese of Toledo. Serving Northwest and North Central Ohio for over 10 years, Annunciation Radio is your home for the Bishop's Corner and other great local shows from our own diocese like Say Yes to Life with Peter Range, Understanding Scripture with Father Dave Nuss, and our live local Catholic morning show, Morning Offering. Listen live on your radio or anytime on demand on the Annunciation Radio app or website. And we are back here at the Bishop's Corner with Bishop Daniel Thomas. So glad you're with us, folks. Thank you. We are always eager to get your questions. You can submit them at the website or the mobile app, or you can also just directly email them to the bishop at AnnunciationRadio.com. Uh, we do ask for your first name, parish, the community you're from, something like that, so the bishop has an idea who he's speaking to. We do uh, try to get them. Uh, we get a lot of questions, folks, and sometimes we don't always get them in, but uh, if you keep listening, you'll hear it somewhere down the road. Uh, we're going to go to Dean in Pemberville, Bishop, says, Dear Bishop Thomas, what determines whether someone should seek the sacrament for anointing of the sick? Is there a level of illness where someone should consider participating in the sacrament? Thanks, Dean. Thank you, Dean, so much. And I'm very grateful for your sensitivity to this because it's very important, first, I would say, to mitigate fear on the one hand and then to encourage receiving the sacrament on the other. So I use that, Dean, very much to say mitigate fear because a lot of folks, either folks who are older or folks who simply have not been fully catechized, catechized and only have heard folks that are older speak, they simply hear, oh, this term extreme unction and oh, well, the sacrament of the sick, that's the, you know, that's just for the dying, which is not true because with, with the new right, as it was organized, certainly in the past, it was understood to be only for the dying. That was viaticum. That is Holy Eucharist was to be given to those who are dying and they were anointed. Now it's very much seen as the anointing of the sick in order to strengthen someone in a physical struggle before a surgery for physical or emotional, for example, or mental difficulty. So if you go to the pastoral care of the sick, the general introduction, number eight, right to the sources, Dean, here's what you'll read. The letter of James states the sick are to be anointed in order to raise them up and save them. Great care and concern should be taken to see that those of the faithful whose health is seriously impaired by sickness or old age receive this sacrament. So there's your answer right there. A prudent or reasonably sure judgment without scruple is sufficient for deciding on the seriousness of an illness. If necessary, a doctor may be consulted. So for example, if someone is having an a surgery, any surgery. I've been anointed every time that I go undergo surgery. When someone is perhaps known to be 
they're going to be placed on hospice. When someone is struggling with cancer, they can be anointed a number of times, even if they may not be close to death, because it's to strengthen them physically and spiritually for that journey. Now, uh, the word periculose has been carefully studied and rendered seriously. That is, when it used to be in danger of death. But now it's your the health is seriously impaired. So rather than gravely or dangerously or perilously, it's now seriously impaired. So I hope that helps to recognize that one would not say, I have a cold, therefore I should be anointed. No, of course not. But that the one whose health is seriously impaired, and that also might be some sort of physical disability, where, uh, which is ongoing, and they may wish to be anointed through that difficulty, if in fact that still persists. Okay, good. Good. Thank you, Bishop. Thank, Thank you, Dean. Question, and we're going to go to Ken and St. Joseph Maumee. Dear Bishop, uh, we know that voting for a pro-choice candidate is a sin since doing so supports the industry and contributes to deaths. My question is if this is a venial sin or a mortal sin. Thanks, Ken. Thank you, Ken, and thanks for writing from Maumee. And we have another question, very, very similarly related. And I can't tell you how many times, Ken, we've answered this question on this show. So, so But you give it a little bit of a new twist, and that is what's yeah, what's the difference? Is it venial or is it mortal? So Ken, right to the sources, I would suggest you go to the Catholic Catechism and you look under the gravity of sin, mortal and venial. And if we had to star a section, Ken, I'd say 1854 through at least number 1860 or 62 of the Catechism. But if I've had to star them, I'd say 1857. For a sin to be mortal, Three conditions must together be met. Mortal sin is sin whose object is grave matter and which is also committed with full knowledge and deliberate consent. So in the end, Ken, that's what would make it mortal. That is the voting. The voting would be mortal if one understands that first the object is grave matter. Ken, of that we have no question. The object is grave matter but it's committed with full knowledge. I know this candidate is pro-abortion and with full knowledge I'm voting for them and perhaps for that reason and deliberate consent. I consent to my vote for that person knowing well that this is grave matter. Now, the next question Ken one might ask is, and this is where it kind of trips us up and gets you into a conundrum. What if both candidates are pro-abortion? Then what do you do? And that's where we use the principle of lesser of two evils from the moral sphere. So which of those two persons more closely aligns with our Catholic faith, even if they both seem to be against life in the womb? And then, for example, 1862, one commits a venial sin when, in a less serious matter, he does not observe the standard prescribed by the moral law, or when he disobeys the moral law in a grave matter, but without full knowledge or without complete consent. So one might say that someone sins venially who votes for one of those people because they may not be aware that this person has voted for repeatedly, has advanced the possibility of abortion, and is absolutely strident in their support for abortion. So you see that it's not as black and white maybe as some people might make it. But it's very clear that abortion is a grave matter and could lead one then into mortal sin. Okay. Thank you, Bishop. Thanks for the question. We're going to go to Emily St. Patrick of Heather Downs. Dear Bishop Thomas, uh, given that abortion is a very serious sin, why does the church still give the Eucharist to politicians who fight for pro-choice policies? Aren't they just as guilty of abortion as the mother getting an abortion or a doctor performing an abortion? Thank you. So, Emily, I think that follows directly on the last question. And once again, Ron, I think we've answered this question oh, yeah. several, several yeah. times. But both of you might be new listeners or viewers, so we're happy to answer it again. And, Emily, I would send you right to the sources. So if you go to the Code of Canon Law, the Church's teaching, Canon 915, here's what it says. Those who have been excommunicated or interdicted after the imposition or declaration of the penalty 
and others, careful language here, Emily, obstinately persevering in manifest grave sin are not to be admitted to Holy Communion. So that's the distinction, Emily, because we know that if there are politicians who claim to be Catholic, but that they are openly and and vociferously for abortion, they vote for it repeatedly, they say this is what has to happen, they are absolute in their support of it, then one would be able to point to Canon 915 and say that they obstinately are persevering in manifest grave sin. And the church says they should not be admitted to Holy Communion. Now, that doesn't say we're not all sinners. Of course we are. But these public figures are obstinately persevering in manifest grave sin. And first, Emily, they themselves should know that. And they themselves should withhold presenting themselves for, for, for Holy Communion unless they've gone to confession and confessed that sin. So I think that's as clear as I okay. can make it. Good. Thanks. For Thank that. you, Ron. Let's get one more. Can we do that, Ron? I think we can. Okay. Uh, from Ethan, Little Flower Toledo, dear Bishop Thomas. Let me drop back. Hold on. Um, okay. We're going backwards because we skipped some. Okay. How, Thank you. How do guardian angels work and why is it so important to pray to them? Thanks, Ethan. Thank you, Ethan. So how do they work? Well, they work because of the grace of God. <laughs> how do they work and what is their work? Obviously, their work... Ethan, because they're pure spirits, we know all the angels, their whole task is ministering in praise and adoration to God. So that we know. And the church teaches us that. Now, why is it so important we pray to them? Well, part of their work, Ethan, we know from Scripture and also the teaching of the church, part of some of their work, because, you know, we know that there are angels and different classes of angels. There are archangels and other angels. Well, we know that the work of Gabriel, for example, was to announce to Mary that she would bear the son of Jesus. We know the work of Michael, the archangel. What is his work? We know the work of Raphael. So the angels in the life of the church go to the sources, Catholic Catechism number 334. The whole life of the church benefits from the mysterious and powerful help of the angels. Why is that? Because they're pure spirits constantly in the presence of the Lord. Number 336. From infancy to death, human life is surrounded by their watchful care and intercession. Beside each believer stands an angel as protector and shepherd, leading him to life. Already here on earth, the Christian life shares by faith in the blessed company of angels, and men are united to God. So, what's the work, Ethan, you asked specifically? Every single person has a guardian angel as protector and shepherd leading us through life. That's why we pray to our guardian angels, and that's why we invoke their intercession, who are always in the presence of God. And I can tell you, I can even say I know specifically times in my life where I know it's been my guardian angel acting on my behalf. All right. Thank you, Bishop. We Thank are you. out of time. I don't know where the time goes, I Ron. Know, it goes fast. Could we get a prayer and a blessing? But I do know that we're so blessed to be in this Holy Week. We're so blessed to have celebrated Palm Sunday. And we'll pray the prayer, the opening prayer. And since we took the gospel from that first procession, I'm going to take the prayer from that Palm Sunday procession as well in this Holy Week. Let us pray. Increase the faith of those who place their hope in you, O God, and graciously hear the prayers of those who call on you, that we who today hold high these branches to hail Christ in his triumph may bear fruit for you by good works accomplished in him, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much, Bishop. Thank you. And if I may just offer our prayerful and sincere heartfelt wishes for this sacred triduum, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and Holy Saturday, and that the Lord will give you many blessings through this celebration of his passion and resurrection. We look forward always to having you with us on the Bishop's Corner. Thanks, Bishop. We'll see you again right here next week at the Bishop's Corner.